Jane, thank you so much for agreeing to do this video interview with me today. Why, thanks for having me, Mr. Guy Wallace. It's always a delight. Thank you. Let me read a little introduction of you for our audience, as there may be a few people who don't know you. But Dr. Jane Bozarth is an experienced real world practitioner and a popular conference presenter. Jane's specialties include capturing and sharing tacit knowledge, social and collaborative learning, and crafting low cost e learning solutions. She has a master's degree in training and development with a specialization in technology-based training and a doctorate in training and development. Jane is the author of many books, including e-learning solutions on a shoestring, better than bullet points, and from analysis to evaluation. After many years working as the e-learning coordinator for North Carolina State Government, Dr. Bozarth is the director of research for the Learning Guild. Jane, let's start with this. What do you think of the current state of the L&D profession? I've been in this business a good long time now, decades now, and I see this, this profession being in flux right now more than I think I ever have. We are trying to balance out traditional instruction with digital approaches that are much, much more now than just another course with the next button, also against user issues uh, as we see more focus on LXD. Uh, I did a research report last year, our salary report, rather than just do a survey of what people were being paid, I did a deep dive into what employers were looking for, looking at job postings and that kind of thing. And the role of, of the instructional designer, which in my world is kind of the, the bigger one, than, than, for instance, the standout platform trainer, the bucket is just overflowing with what those people are being asked to do. It's so much bigger than just instructional design anymore. I mean, I have a friend who is a face-to-face -face trainer who designs e-learning, who was recently asked to build a mobile app to support a conference, who's being asked to build leaderboards and, and games. Uh, it's crazy. So I do think for right now, the profession is moving, thank goodness, in an evidence-based direction and a we're going to we're going to do what works direction not just keep pumping out you know content but i also see that we're going to have to to start taking a look at how these jobs are breaking apart and what tasks really belong in which place there is you and i you are on the same page about this one there is a mountain, a mountain of research showing, not showing rather, not showing any connection between some definition of learning style and teaching to that style and outcomes. You know, there may in fact be different styles. We haven't clearly defined those yet, but we, we are pretty certain that teaching, adjusting our teaching, adjusting our approaches, to accommodate some definition of style is just not effective. That really it is, it is the content, it's the experience, it's what we need at the end of the, the, the performance pipe that really matters when we talk about creating instruction, creating effective experiences. I am not saying people don't have the preferences. I am not saying people like something over another thing, but I am saying that tailoring instruction to that has not shown to be effective. I think the most current research that we need to put in place, uh, apart from that, I think we need to take a real look at, at generations and what we have said about that because many, many times, I worked in HR for a long time, that's where my I was housed. It, it just smacked age discrimination to me the more I hear about it. And I did a, a research report on that uh, earlier this year and I was, I was surprised. I thought I was gonna find a lot of data saying that there had been some sort of, of quantifiable relationship there. I thought that we would see that there had been more grievances that seemed to be caused by age clashes, that we would see more workplace conflict documented because of some clash between this perception of, of people of different generations. And that just wasn't there. It's all very anecdotal and it is usually unfounded and it usually is not at all related to how old someone is. A great deal of that research, for one thing, doesn't, you know, we don't define generations very well. 
we, we put people into brackets by um, important events in American history. They aren't necessarily important to European history or to history in China or Japan or some of the, the groups that we're talking about. We look at global organizations. Um, and it just, it just comes across as very uh, arbitrary. Um, what we do see, though, as far as age goes, is that generally you've got a 23-year-old who may hop jobs a little bit more than somebody who's in a, a, a long-time role at a bigger company who's in their mid-40s. You, you might see uh, someone younger who does want more time off to deal with newborns and toddlers and daycares and soccer games than somebody who's a little bit older and that is getting retold as they're not interested and they're not working hard. I have seen some cases where people who are um, later in their careers are a little bit jealous of some of the perks the young people have started kind of demanding. You know, I need time with my family. I need time with my kids. And, um, you know, they're mad that they didn't ask for it better, I guess. I don't, I don't know. But, but the research just doesn't say that there's a correlation between this perception of generation and some sort of uh, any effect on performance, by the way. There's nothing that says there's performance. Um, I tried to locate uh, research even I could compare, and there was an interesting study I found. They, they had a 200 papers, I think they came up with 20 that made comparisons similar enough that they could actually look at the, the data and side by side. I mean, there's almost no um, understanding of what we're looking for or what we mean. It just seems to be convenient. You know, the, the other thing that bothers me the most, I think, about the generation stuff is that because of the stereotyping, you know, that's one of the things we can see. You can see what color someone is, you can see um, wh what age someone is, more, you can make a pretty educated guess, and th those are things that are harder to pin down. I mean, are harder to, um, I'm sorry, I said that badly. Those are the things that you're just easier to make snap judgments about. Oh, well, they brought in a bunch of 22 year olds to work in that new department. You know what that's going to be like? You know, they immediately are dismissed because of that group. And, and back to my original point, I've said this many times. If we talked about any other working group the way we talk about millennials or, or the younger generations, there would be lawsuits. You know, they, there would be there would be a problem, and, and we don't really uh, we don't we don't see that now. So I think we need to to cut them some slack, and I think we need to pay attention to what real issues are versus our our easy perceptions of how we're categorizing people. put them into a big bucket because you and I have talked about this a lot I would put them into a big bucket of anything that attempts to categorize human beings into simple boxes is causing trouble and that's learning styles it's personality type assessments it's generations you know this this need we have for easy answers and simple tricks for managing a given group um, do, doesn't work very well. It's very appealing. It's like astrology. Oh, well, I'm this type and I do this and I do this and you say that and it'll, it'll work. I understand the desire to oversimplify and to, to categorize things, but I think it gets us into trouble. And I, I've written about this in particular about learning style. Um, you know, uh, a conversation was, well, so what, Jane? We're trying to make things more interesting for people. What's the harm? Well, there is harm if a child who has a legitimate learning issue is categorized as kinesthetic and shoved into some group where he's told to go play sports all day instead of getting the real help he needs. There's real harm if an employee does not get a promotion because they've been um, dismissed as just being a kid who's not interested in sticking with a job for very long. I mean, there is, there is harm. It's not just, oh, well, that's cute and it doesn't work. I, I, I think we need to pay attention to where the stereotypes and the attempts to oversimplify um, can hurt uh, employees or can hurt our, our initiatives, can hurt our own out outcomes.